Do you want to start a business to give your family more freedom? Do you desire to have a marriage that makes your friends jealous? Do you want to spend more quality time with your children? We are your hosts, Matt and Jocelyn Woodruff, and we cannot wait to share this journey with you. Welcome to our family-friendly podcast. Join our conversations where we talk about how to build a business that will give us the freedom we choose. Welcome to the Family Life Movement Podcast. Welcome to the Family Life Movement Podcast. Today we have Stacy Chalimi. Stacy is on a mission to transform health of millions worldwide. Check out her website at the complete herbal guide, sorry, dot com, the complete herbal guide.com. She is a popular and recognizable health and lifestyle reporter and expert, columnist and health host. The author of the complete guide to natural healing and natural remedies for the common conditions along with 20 other published books. She is the founder of the Complete Herbal Guide and a recognized health and natural remedies expert with over 20 years in practice as a health coach. She wrote for the Huffington Post, Huff Post, Thrival Global, and Medium, which is owned by Ariana Huffington. She has been a guest on the Dr. Oz Show, local news, and numerous radio shows. Her focus is on natural healing, herbal remedies, alternative methods, self-motivation, food for medicine, nutrition, fitness, natural beauty remedies, and the power of positive thinking. Stacey, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So Stacey, I want you to tell us a little bit about what brought you to this place in life. Well, you know, it all started, I, I had... Um, developed uh, encephalitis at the age of five. I had a virus um, that had traveled to my brain and uh, the virus I called, uh, called encephalitis had traveled throughout my brain and caused scar tissue damage. Till this day, they can't find the scar tissue damage. I was in the um, hospital. Um, I was there in a coma for several days. Um, you know, when, um, when I was there, they didn't know if, if I, when I came out, if I was gonna be paraplegic or um, you know what, what severe brain damage I might have from it, but when I came out, um, there was nothing wrong with me. I asked for McDonald's French fries, and uh, but the one thing I was left with was that um, that scar tissue damage that they can't find till this day, and it, which left me with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. um, I had developed seizures throughout my entire life, and I had struggled um, perversely trying to um, deal with my epilepsy. And as I gotten older, um, I had a, a really hard time, especially when I was going through college. I was trying to struggle, trying to figure out a way I could, you know, do that late night study in all that stress of uh, going to college and not have seizures and be able to actually finish college and move on with my life. And I wasn't having an easy time. And I had to, I had written a, a letter to the Epilepsy Foundation. They had a magazine, and I asked for them to publish my magazine and I, my article in, my, in the magazine and I asked them how do other people cope with this disorder I'd like to hear from others telling me how they cope with the disorder and surprisingly I had hundreds of letters from all the United States and Canada come to my home uh, people sharing their stories telling me how they um, dealt with epilepsy how they cope with it on a daily basis and it was so inspiring it really you know it made you realize at that moment that you weren't alone that there were other people out there and not just with epilepsy, but with every disorder. A lot of times when we have disorders or diseases, we think we're alone. We don't realize that there are so many people out there, just like you and I, that have similar situations that are struggling. And, you know, it's, it's so nice when people could just reach out and help each other. And I had put together, over the years, I had started a book. I wanted to use a lot of those inspiring stories and inspire others. Uh, because back then, um, they didn't have many books on epilepsy. There was probably 
like five or six books on epilepsy. And then there was a couple of books, um, you know, written by doctors. And, uh, you know, it just went, if you weren't a doctor yourself, it just went right over your head. The, to medical terminology, wouldn't really, you know, a lot of people wouldn't comprehend what they were trying to get across. And uh, so I started that book and then I had finished college and uh, I went to New York and I was working for a big corporation and uh, I had fell to the ground and I had a seizure and one of the producers had walked over me and kept walking and uh, I was just left on the ground and I saw him because I was half conscious and I saw him do that and I couldn't believe myself that he did that and when about half an hour later, I was released from my position um, because of that seizure. And so I just, you know, at that moment, I didn't let it get me down. I just said, you know, I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm going to move on. You know, there's more out there. And uh, so what I did was is that I just moved on. And, uh, you know, not too long after the Epilepsy Foundation asked me to speak in front of Congress, I spoke in front of Congress for job discrimination. I, you know, I shared with, uh, you know, with uh, all different politicians all over the United States about what happened to me and, you know, how it made me feel. And, uh, and I just moved on. And, you know, it was at that point, too, I started, I started writing, I started doing a lot of writing, I started a little blog called on um, blogger. Um, and back then, that was like the, the, the big thing was blogger. And, uh, you know, I had like 400 people come on and they were, you know, they were reading my stuff. And uh, I start, I started uh, working for an herbalist, and I was doing a lot of research and writing for this herbalist. And I was and as I was doing that, I was writing articles and publishing them about self-healing and I was applying a lot of those things to my own body because it was like wow you know maybe this could help me and I went from having like nine seizures a month to six seizures a month to five to four to three to two and my seizures just got better and better so I figured you know if this could help me could you imagine what it could do for people all around the world and imagine you know if, if it could you know help just people with epilepsy, if people applied self-healing to any dis disorder, disease, or, or condition, what it might do for them. And that's how it all started. And then I was working for a freelance, um, he was a, he, he, uh, uh, a website designer. He goes, you know, I could really make you a really pretty website when he saw all my content. And he created a website and I went from 400 to 10,000. And then I went and I, I, and I had my website redesigned again, and it went from 10,000 to 500,000. And that's where we are today. And, you know, like people have a really deep love for natural healing, you know, and I wrote, um, I wrote 20 books in the meanwhile, you know, and I just, you know, it's amazing how powerful words can be and how they can inspire people. And with that book, with Epilepsy, You're Not Alone, I had, when that got published, that hit um, the best selling um, in, in, uh, for books with epilepsy. And, um, one person had wrote me and they said that they were on the verge of committing suicide, that they, you know, that everything in their life went downhill once they got epilepsy. And uh, they said when they read my book and they applied a lot of the regiments and a lot of the tools and strategies I, I suggested, they said that their life changed and turned around. And it was really then, you know, it was like a great feeling. If you could help somebody, it's just the feeling is unbelievable. If, you know, if you could do something good for another human being, you know, um, the feeling of accomplishment is wonderful. And I realized then the, the, the wisdom of words, how powerful words can be and how they can affect other people's lives. And it was from that moment on, I just kept moving forward. Wow. Your story is amazing. <laughs> uh, you have come a long way. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love your story. And I love, one of the biggest things I love is that you took a bad situation. You took that and you looked at that as an opportunity to learn and to experience something new and to better yourself. And I think that that relates a lot to where we're at around the world right now. As we're recording this, recording this on May 8th, uh, you know, we have the coronavirus running rampant and, and yeah. different things like that. So I think there's a great parallel between your story and the things, some of the things that you've been through and, and, you know, maybe not seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, it's, it's difficult for people to see and wrap their head around when and what this is going to look like when it ends. And so right. I, I think you are the perfect guest to have, to have at this time. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so, so tell us,
us what you think that um, some family, the families that are going through this, what, what are they feeling right now? What, why are they feeling that way? You know, I think a lot of times too, like people feel um, the lack of purpose, you know, in, in during this time, you know, the, you know, when we go get up in the morning or we go to work or we take care of our children or we have some type of regimen going on, there's a purpose in our lives. You know, every day we're doing things and we feel that we're doing it for a reason and a good reason. Now we're confined in quarantine in our home. We can't do the things that we normally do. A lot of people aren't working right now. A lot of people are stuck home the kids are stuck home and you know what's their purpose what's our purpose you know and that has a lot to do with it too and then as silly as it may sound our diets you know we're eating you know the way we shouldn't eat you know a lot of foods can actually you know fog your head up you know just a, a lot of processed foods and a lot of foods that aren't good for you you know could actually you know fog your brain up make you fatigue not make you feel good you know and you know, when you're home you're snacking away because there's nothing else to do you know it's like you know you're grabbing something or you're you know you're thinking about food and you know it's, it's just you know when you're out and you're busy and you're about you're not thinking about the food you're not thinking about you're thinking about productive things purpose you know meaning you know and you're doing things that you feel good about as a person where we're home and we're, we're just confined and and that could be very depressing and you know very fearful for, for people too I recently heard somebody talking about not the fresh freshman 15, but the pandemic 15. The quarantine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's really true. You know, we're not as active right now because we're stuck at home. Right. And yeah, I, I've definitely experienced that mind fog um, with related to a diet. And I've also experienced that you, if you don't have a purpose, you don't know where you're going. You don't right. have any motivation to do anything. Exactly. You don't know where you're going. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are great. I, I think also there's a lot to do with, uh, you know, if you're not going outside, you, you, you miss that, that stimuli. You miss yes. different things, the smells, the taste of going out into the world. And when you don't have those things to kind of jog or to, to, to zap your brain, for lack of better words, uh, it's really easy to get down in this funk. Yeah. Where you're looking and you're seeing very common colors, things that are familiar. And so you don't have those extra things that are just kind of coming into your brain and right. making you think, making you, um, you know, making your brain ask questions, searching for new answers. And I think that that kind of goes in, back into what you were saying about brain fog and having trouble finding that purpose. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I agree 100%. And, you know, also, too, the weather plays a toll, too. You're stuck in that house. You feel in prison in your own home. And then over here in New Jersey, it's been raining almost every day. We maybe had two nice days out of the entire time we've been quarantined over here. And it's just been cold, dreary, you know, gloomy in the sky, just rainy. And when you're looking out the window and you're, you're confined in prison in your home, you're not enjoying the outside, the beauty of the sun the grass nature you know you're not appreciating you know life for what it is you can get very depressed and it's just very it's it's very down and on a person so you made a really interesting uh point and a really interesting illustration that i've seen personally when i was doing prison ministry uh, you use that the illustration of a house and related it to a prison as isolation, as being confined to this small place. Yeah. Which I don't think there's any question in anyone's mind that that does, uh, for lack of a better word, it does wonders to your brain. And oh, it yeah. And really start playing tricks and, and stuff like that. So as we're walking through this time, as we're kind of, and I like that, as we're kind of stuck in our own prison, do you think that this is more fear of the unknown? We don't know when this thing is going to be over. We don't know when we're going to be able to go outside and play with our kids, go to the playground, go back to work as it is. Do you think that that is the, the biggest fear and the biggest frustration along with this idea, this mentality that we're in our own, our own prison, which in our prison, 
interesting enough, and I know this is getting into a lot more to the psychology than, than uh, family and business and stuff, mm-hmm. but our house, our safe place has become our prison in a sense. Because we don't always want to be here 24 seven, you know, mentally we need to get out. We need it for our own, for our own, you know, salvation of the mind. We need to get out. We need to explore and not be confined in one small area every single day. You know, it's, we don't want to do that. You know, we're, it's against what we want, you know, and, and, and the fear of the unknown, we don't know what to expect next because, you know, nobody's sure, you know, and it, it's just, it, it's scary, you know, and they're saying maybe a second epidemic in the fall. They don't know. Everything is up in the air. And even with finances, you know, finance pays a it plays a huge um, stress, you know, it, with every every couple, even when couples first get married, every, all the time, you know, money is, is a big issue because you need it to survive, you know, and when, you know, people are getting laid off or they're not working as much and they're not getting paid for the hours they're not working and you see businesses left and right going out of, out of, um, out of, of business, it's scary, you know, it's like, what's going to happen to this nation? You know, are we going to be just an online internet, you know, service, you know, it's like, what is the world coming to, you know, and then it was the next day, like not too long after we have a, we have something on the news about the killer hornets, you know, coming to America. So it's like, you know, you want to talk about, you know, revelations, you know, that's a, you know, you feel it's like, what's going on here? You know, it's crazy. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, I was talking to Jocelyn yesterday, <laughs> or not, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, but, you know, we were talking about, and, and thank the good Lord, this is not a politics podcast. I cannot, I, I'm not a big <laughs> politics fan, mm-hmm. um, but it's funny. We were talking about how this pandemic with everything and the fears and stuff like that were happening and stuff. And you know, we were talking about, you know, the different rules and stuff like that Congress was trying to pass and our president and stuff like that. And it's interesting because everyone's got their own perception of what's Mm -hmm. going on and how it's affecting them. And there's no rule book. You know, there was nobody that came beforehand and said, hey, you know what, this is what happens when the entire country gets ran down. Yeah. What happens when your, you know, your finances just tank Mm -hmm. pandemic. Like we, we've been through the Great Depression there's some notes and stuff like that that we can learn from, but that right. happened because of an illness or a virus or however you want to describe yeah. mm-hmm. the virus yeah. that's going around. And so it, it, there's no, there's not a rule book that says, Hey, you know, here's the right decision to make. Right. So I think that that's something really important, really. Uh, yeah. I had said something like, um, I'm really glad I'm not a decision maker because there is no right you, no matter what you do, you're going to make somebody mad and you're going to make somebody happy. No matter. Oh, always, yeah. always, you know. I just, I'm so <laughs> glad I'm caught in that role. <laughs> so other than like different parties of government, what other myths about this time that, you know, what do you think would actually hurt our mind frame during this time? Uh, as we adapt them into our everyday lives. Like, you know, there's a lot of people out there right now who are saying, Hey, you know what? The the president's doing incredible. He's doing horrible. He's, you know, this, that, and we're adopting these different mindsets into our everyday life. Yeah. We're we're finding someone to blame. That might actually be a better uh, way to word it was, it was, we're playing the blame games, but Mm -hmm. what other things that we're adapting during this time, can actually hurt us a lot more than help us. Well, I think there's a lot of fake news out there too. I think you have to know where to go to to get the right news. Like you go online and you can see there's so much fake news and so many, you know, people are making suggestions from their own opinion, making it sound like scientific, you know, news. You know, like if you want to go to get accurate information, go to the disease control, you know, you know, go to reliable, you know, um, websites like WebMD, you know, like, you know, places that you know that are going to be, you know, truly accurate 
accurate. They're going to, everything they've written is documented by either scientists or doctors and every, everything is verified. So you want to go to a place that you know is, is verified and accurate. You know, there's so many things, you know, I think one person I saw online said, you know, garlic can make it go away. You know, it's just, you know, it was just like, you know, crazy stuff, you know, it's just like, a, you have to really realize that you can't believe everything you read, especially on Facebook. That's like the, the main, main place where it's like totally, you know, it, it's just, uh, you know, you hear lots of, and I also, one thing that makes me mad too, is I see a lot of people trying to make money off of this, you know, this is a terrible, you know, epidemic and, and people are trying to figure out ways they can make a quick buck, you know, which is also really, you know, makes me angry. And you have to realize you have to be able to spot those people and be able to not fall for their traps because there's a lot of traps out there. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so what are some things that families can do to help them work through this time? Any suggestions on that regard? I feel that, you know, connection and communication is really important, especially among teens and, and tweens, you know, a lot of times they can get into their, their cell phones and get into their, you know, Netflix and, and disappear on you. But, you know, sometimes they feel a lot of things and they just don't, they don't share it with their parents. You know, like I, you know, especially when the kids get to my, my kids are in their teens and, and young adults, you know, so to try to get, you know, college kids and, and teenagers to, to confess and tell me what their emotions are is really it's a really big task you know I've had conversations with my kids trying to get them to tell me how they feel about certain things you know and at the end of the conversation my one son told me let's not have this conversation ever again so it's like you know they want to communicate they want to love they want you as their parent but sometimes they don't want to always um, confide in you with certain things they might feel you know might be a sign of weakness to them it might be whatever the case may be they might be embarrassed but you could do your best to try to communicate with them and just throw it out there that, you know, I'm here. If you have any fears, if you have any questions, you know, I'm here to answer. I'm not here to judge, you know, and you want to make sure your kids know that you're not going to judge them no matter what, you know, the situation is, you know, if they're scared about the coronavirus and they, you know, there are certain things making them scared, you know, that, you know, you can come and talk to me anytime and I'm always here. You can wake me up in the middle of the night and I'll be there for you, you know, and just really reinforce it, you know, just, you know, you just reinforce it to your kids, you know, and then you could also reinforce if they have that one good friend that you know, that actually has a good head on their shoulders, you could say, oh, you know, you could talk to so and so, you know, but make sure it's a kid with that has a good head on his shoulders, you know, but, uh, you know, and for the little ones, you know, you could even make a coloring book for the little ones. I did that one time with my kids, like, um, I was trying to explain something to them. And I drew pictures because they were really young, they were like three and four, you know, and, you know, they, they their comprehension of certain things, especially topics that could be difficult, you know, you can, you can actually, you know, make little pictures and you're not, you don't have to be an artist, you know, and just, you know, it's fun for them to look at and, you know, and then you can like make a little story and that makes it interesting for them and they absorb it really well. Kids love stories in any form. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea of a coloring book. I, I, I looked on YouTube and, you know, cause they were asking me questions about this virus and, um, and I didn't like what they, there was like one video at the time and I really didn't care. I didn't feel like, I felt like it was old information at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, it wasn't really accurate anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, yeah. So I, I really like the idea of a coloring book cause then you can, um, bring it to whatever their current level is. And I think that's really important is that you don't want to go into a whole bunch of, we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, I found a, a free online, uh, free um, homeschool curriculum specifically on viruses. And my husband was like, really be careful with our five-year-old because he was afraid that she was going to really internalize it too much. Yeah. Yeah. See her, they talked about washing hands a lot. And I could really see her becoming OCD and washing her hands raw. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, so we need to modify that a little bit. You got to know your kid's personality. I think right. So. Oh, definitely. 100%. Yeah. I think one of the, 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 the refreshing things that I heard you say, and, and, I, and I love that, is that this is not a time to hide from our kids. This is not a time mm -hmm. for, you know, to say, hey, you know what? There's nothing really going on outside and stuff like that. Instead, 
figure out a way to relate it down to them. Understand mm-hmm. that means you have to get to know your, your child, parents, right. uh, bring it down to them and make them a part of the discussion. Right. And this is going to help them to, to learn and, you know, practice washing their hands. Not we're all not, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it also allows them to see and to feel how we deal with, with different issues in the world, because this is not going to be the last pandemic the last bad thing the last horrible right event that happens you know regardless of where you're at in the world there's things that happen each and every single day and mm-hmm. if you fight it and then they see something they're not going to ha- know how to internalize it or cope, to cope yeah uh, how to cope with it or how to express it emotionally right so, what are some ways that we should encourage our children, especially our young kids, you know, five, seven, younger, a little younger, a little older, what are some ways that we can encourage them to express their emotions as they're going through some of the frustration of being quarantined inside their house? You know, especially when as adults, we don't necessarily understand how we're feeling about if that all makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. It does. You know, sometimes you can, you know, you could also, what you could do is too, is like you could do something that's friendly when you could do like a, a game with the kids, you know, and as you're playing the game with the kids, you can, you know, ask them questions and, you know, like simple questions to get a feel of where they're at and then, you know, start giving them a little bit of advice and, you know, and then I always try to relate it. I always, when the kids were younger, I related it even now when they're older, you know, it's, it's just a cycle. Everything we do, they they do, you know, and so it's like you can say, you know, when I was your age, I did this, and you know, I or I thought that, and it's okay, you know, and this is what I did to make myself feel better, you know, and then you know, and and I think that makes them feel good too. Awesome, I love that. <laughs> Very practical. Yeah, I I've also heard. Um, I didn't know you were asking that question, but, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I had heard uh, that a lot of psychologists when they're working with kids, um, they will use stuffed animals and the, the kids will talk through their animals or bears or toys or dolls or whatever. Right. They'll, they'll talk their feelings through the animal or the, the stuffed animal. Yeah. Instead of their, it, it's easier for them to verbalize it through the animal rather than themselves. And I thought that was, that would be a good way of, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We but we've like, seen it in yeah. our our own kids to where they're like, oh, you know, Teddy Bear is sad, mm-hmm. or he's not he's scared, he's scared or mm-hmm. something like mm-hmm. that. I think it's really important to, and you know, kind of what you're saying is acknowledge those feelings, encourage those feelings. Hey, yeah, oh wow, you're scared. Well, what is it that you're scared of? Like, yeah, you know, finding a solution. Yeah, well, like Together. not even completely finding that solution as much as acknowledging the, the problem, the hiccup, the struggle. And, and then once your, you know, your child is heard, mm-hmm. once they understand, you know, if, 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 you know, for the families, you know, we have daughters, you, you know, they need to know that they're, how they feel is important. They need to know that, that their feelings regardless if we're feeling the same way they need to know and understand that their feelings matter yeah and, and i think i think with that. with the teddy bear thing it was really good because i think it's like they're they're too embarrassed to say it's them so mm-hmm. they're talking through the teddy bear and it's not them but it's the teddy bear you know and they're still looking for the answer or the reinforcement you know but they they don't have to admit that it's actually them feeling that way um so do you have any ideas for how they can cope these kids cope with having to stay home and not seeing their friends, that interaction, social aspect that they're missing out. Well, I think the, you know, having the internet and having the, you know, and, you know, having the computer and, and the iPhone has been a really, you know, big help. They also have, they have like applications now, like called Hangout and other stuff where they can all go on just like Zoom, all go on at once, you know, and have a bunch of people talking at the same time. And it kind of gives them the feel, you know, they know they're not with each other, but it gives them the feeling that their friends aren't that far away, you know. And uh, I think that's like helpful too. We've done that with family too. Yeah. Yeah. Calls with 
grandparents. And things. A lot of people were doing that during the holidays, like Easter time and stuff like yep. that, and Passover. They were doing that. They were uh, they were doing that um, with uh, w with it also. Yeah, I think that ha yeah, those are. I didn't know about Hangout. That's a new one on me. Uh, I, I, Google we, Hangouts. We have. I don't think it's Google Hangouts. I thought it was something different. <laughs> but um, yeah, but we have smaller kids. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was trying to encourage my kids. I guess uh, Facebook Messenger has a kids version. We we're trying to get her to use that a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because it, it that way it, it encouraged her to work on reading and writing as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> she was just really giving us a fight about it. Um, so that was a that was a nice thing. So. So, are there any other tips, tricks, habits that you can? Uh, that as parents we can implement with our kids uh you know especially during this this time frame um i think it's good to just try to like you have quality time with the kids like do like different things like you maybe even bacon you know if the kids like to bake you know maybe bake cookies and while you're baking cookies you start to talk and believe it or not simple things like that actually grow bondedness you know between the child the mother the father or even like if like if a boy and his father you know you pick a, a more manly thing even watching tv you know you watch wrestling on tv you know and you just sit there and you just you know and, and as you're talking you know you know you bring up little stuff in in between you know and it kind of brings the bond in because you have something in common and then you know the trust factor and then you know you can share and communicate with one another and actually you know learn stuff that you may not have known before and then help them and give them the advice and the and the guidance that he needs or her I, girls can like wrestling too i like wrestling <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Family Life Movement Podcast. I hope you had as much fun as we did. To hear our thoughts on the podcast and to continue this conversation, join our free Facebook group by searching for the Family Life Movement. See the show notes for links to our guest social media and websites and any resources that were mentioned will also be linked in the show notes. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please go rate and review and send us a screenshot and we will send you a special access gift. Join us next time for more conversations, tips, and tricks on growing your business around your family. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.